seventh Sunday after Trinity, Lord of all power and might, who art the author and giver of all good things, graft into our hearts a love of thy name. Increase in us true religion, fear of the Lord, reverence, humility, teachability, and nourish us with all goodness. Of thy great mercy, keep us in the same. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Verse 1 of Hymn 174. At the Lamb's high feast, we sing praise to our victorious King, who washed us in the tide, flowing from his pierced side. Praise we him whose love divine gives his sacred blood for wine gives his body for the feast, Christ the victim, Christ the priest. Well, we turn to Professor Alan Bloom's seminal and formative work on American education. His big thesis is how higher education has failed our country and has impoverished the souls of students. That's <clears throat> quite the thesis. We get a forward here by Saul Bellow. He's an American writer, literature. So let's just start. Um, maybe I should just take a look quickly. Table contents. He talks about um, part one, the students, books, music, relationships, self-centeredness, equality, race, sex, separateness, divorce, love, and eros. And then part two, nihilism. He makes a big deal of that, which is a, was a hard chapter. And part three, the university, from Socrates to Heidegger's rectorestrade, Rousseau's radicalization in the German university, 60s and the student university, decomposition of the university. Professor Bloom has his own way of doing things, writing about higher education in America. He does not observe the forms, manners, and ceremonies of what is usually called the community of scholars, yet his credentials are irreproachable. His, he is author of an excellent book on Shakespeare's politics and has translated Plato's Republic and Rousseau's Emile. It will be difficult for nettled colleagues to wave him away, and many will want to do just that, for he is shrewd and meddlesome, as well as learned, and a great observer of what Mencken would call when he was being mean, higher learning. But Professor Bloom is neither a debunkist nor satirist, and his conceptions, conception of seriousness carries him far beyond the positions of academia. He's not addressing himself primarily to the professors. They are welcome to listen, and they will listen because they come under heavy fire, but he listens himself. He places himself in a larger community than the invoking Socrates, Plato, Machiavelli, Rousseau, and Kant more often than he does our contemporaries. Quote, real community of man in the midst of all the self-contradictory simulacrum of community is the community of those who seek the truth of the potential knowers of all men to the extent they desire to know. But this includes only a few of the true friends, as Plato was to Aristotle, at the very moment they were disagreeing about the nature of good. They were absolutely one soul as they looked at the problem. This, according to Plato, is the real friendship the only common good. It is here that the contact people so desperately seek is to be found. This is the meaning of the riddle of the improbable philosopher kings. They have a true community that is exemplary for all other communities. A style of this sort will seem to modern readers marred by classical stiffness, truth, knowers, the good, man, but we can by no means deny that behind our objection to such language is a guilty consciousness of flimsiness and even a trashiness of our modern talk about values. Well, 
<laughs> I remember reading this in 1987, just as I was coming into the, the, uh, the sub base as, uh, for that particular tour and getting it just as it was coming off the press and sitting, reading it wherever I read a, we had a house at 127 Gunjiwamp Road, an Indian name. And this thing blew my socks off. That's 33 years ago. So we're retouring and we've done it a few other times. It's really pretty, it was pretty shocking and insightful. <clears throat> The sentences above are taken from the conclusion of Bloom's book. Parting from his readers, he is at his most earnest. He writes in a different vein when he's discussing the power of professional economists, the separation of modern science from natural philosophy that preceded it, the phenomena called cultural relativism, or the real, the bottom line significance of an MBA degree. He often flashes out provocatively and wickedly. Speaking of the place of the humanities in the university, he calls them a submerged old Atlantis to which we turn again to find ourselves. Now that everybody else has given up, the humanities are like the Paris flea market where amid the masses of junk, people with a good eye found occasional treasures or else, like the refugee camp where all the geniuses <laughs> driven out of their jobs and countries by unfriendly regimes are idling. <laughs> oh, that's so class. The other two divisions of the university have no use for the past. When he is not busy with the nature of the good, he can hit with the best of them very hard. <laughs> as a scholar, he intends to enlighten us. And as a writer, he has learned from Aristophanes and other models that enlightenment should also be enjoyable. <laughs> Paris flea market. <laughs> A refugee camp where the geniuses have been driven out of their jobs and countries. Oh, to me, this is not a book of a professor, but that of a thinker who is willing to take risks more frequently taken by writers. It is a risky book of ideas to speak in one's own voice, but it reminds us that the sources of the truest truths are inevitably profoundly personal. Bloom <laughs> Paris Flea Market. <laughs> oh my. Wrote this book, I referred to Plato's Republic, which is for me the book on education because it really explains to me what I experience as a man and teacher. Academics, even those describing themselves as existentialists very seldom offer themselves publicly and frankly as individuals, as persons. So Professor Bloom is a frontline fighter in mental wards of our times and such singularly congenial to me. If I can be personal, I can see no reasons why I should remain the anonymous commentator. In his concluding pages, Bloom tells of a student who after reading the symposium said it was a hard it was hard today to imagine the magic Athenian atmosphere in which friendly men educated lively on the footing of equality civilized but natural came together and told wonderful stories about the meaning of their longing but adds bloom such experiences are always accessible actually this playful discussion took place in the midst of a terrible war that Athens was destined to lose. And Aristophanes and Socrates could at least foresee that this meant the decline of Greek civilization. But they were not given to cultural despair and in the terrible political consequences, their abandon to the joy of nature proved viable 
by ability what's best in man. We feel ourselves too dependent on history. What is essential about any of the platonic dialogues is reproducible in almost times and places. <clears throat> I take this statement very seriously and I'm greatly moved by it, seeing in it the seed from which my life grew. For as a Midwesterner, the son of, he said, now this is all bellows. I recognized at an early age, I was called upon to decide for myself to what extent my Jewish origins, my surroundings, my schooling were to be allowed to determine the course of my life. I did not intend to be wholly dependent on history and culture. Full dependency must mean that I was done for. The commonest teaching of the civilized world in our time can be stated too simply, quote, Tell me where you come from and I will tell you what you are, close quote. There was not a chance in the world that Chicago, with its agreement of my eagerly Americanizing extended family, would make in its image. Before I was capable of thinking clearly, my resistance to its material weight took the form of obstinacy. I couldn't say why I could not allow myself to become the product of an environment. But gainfulness, utility, prudence, business had no hold on me. My mother wanted me to be a fiddler, or failing that, a rabbi. I had my choice between playing dinner music at the Palmer House or presiding over a synagogue. In traditional Orthodox families, small boys were taught to translate Genesis and Exodus, so I might easily have gone on to the rabbinic if the great world, the world of the streets, had not been so seductive. Besides, a life of pious observance was not for me. Anyways, I had begun at an early time to read widely, and I was quickly carried away from the ancient religion. Reluctantly, my father allowed me at 17 to enter the university, where I was an enthusiastic but erratic and contrary student. If I signed up for Econ 201, I was sure to spend all my time reading Ibsen and Shaw. Registering for a poetry course, of course, I was soon bored by meters and stanzas and shifted my attention to Croppet, Kant's memoirs of a revolutionist and Lenin's What Is to Be Done. My tastes and habits were those of a writer. I preferred to read poetry on my own without the benefit of lectures on the cesura. To rest my book-strained eyes, I played pool and ping-pong at the men's club. I was soon aware that in the view of advanced European thinkers, the cultural expectations of a young man from Chicago, that center of brute materialism, were bound to be disappointed. Put together the slaughterhouses Steel mills and still thinking back to his illustration of the Paris flea market. <clears throat> the gloom of the financial district, the ballparks and prize fights, the machine politicians, the prohibition gang wars, and you had a solid cover of social Darwinist darkness, impenetrable by the rays of culture hopeless for the judgment of highly refined Englishmen, Frenchmen, Germans, and Italians, the spokesman for art in its most advanced forms. For some of these observers, America had many advantages over Europe. It's more productive, more energetic, more free, largely immune from pathogenic politics and ruinous wars. But as for art, as Wyndham Lewis put it, to have been born an Eskimo then in Minnesota Presbyterian who wanted to be a bee. <laughs> oh, 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 reading can be fun. Civilized Europeans, often exceptionally free from class prejudices of their own countries, were able conveniently to lodge their not fully mastered biases in the free-for-all of the USA. 
when no one was able to foresee was that all civilized countries were destined to descend to a common cosmopolitanism and the lamentable weakenings of the older branches of civilization would open fresh opportunities and free us from our dependency on history. In this regard, I find myself as Americans have taken to saying between a rock and a hard place. European observers sometimes classify me as a hybrid curiosity, neither fully American nor satisfactorily European, stuffed with references to the philosophers, the historians, and poets I've consumed higgedly, piggedly in my Midwestern lair. I'm, of course, an autodidact, as modern writers always are. The spirited newcomer, the 19th century novelist, Guest ventured, conjectured daringly. Independent intelligence made its synthesis. Balzac declared, the world belongs to me because I understand it. Professor Bloom makes me fear that the book of the world so richly studied by autodidacts is being closed to the learned who are raising walls of opinion to shut the world out. From a different standpoint, American readers sometimes object to the kind of foreignness in my books. I mention old world writers. I have highbrow airs and appear to put on a dog. <laughs> I readily concede that here and there I am probably hard to read, and I am likely to become harder as the illiteracy of the public increases. It is never an easy task to take the mental measure of your readers. These are things that people should know if they are to read books at all. And out of respect for them or to save appearances, one is apt to assume more familiarity on their part with the history of the 20th century than is objectively justified. Besides a certain psychic unity is always taken for granted by writers, quote, others are in essence like me and I am basically like them give or take a few minor differences, close quote. A piece of writing is an offering. You bring it to the altar of hope and hope it will be accepted. You pray at least that rejection will not throw you into rage and turn you into a cane. Perhaps naively, you produce your favorite treasures and pile them in an indiscriminate heap. I'm going to skip that. There are times when I enjoy making fun of the educated American. Herzog, for instance, was meant to be a comic novel. A PhD from a good American university falls apart when his wife leaves him for another man. <clears throat> he is taken by an epistolary fit and writes grieving, biting, ironic, rambunctious letters, not just to his friends and acquaintances, but also to the great men and the giants of thought who formed his mind. What is he to do in this moment of crisis? Pull Aristotle or Spinoza from the shelf and storm through the pages looking for consolation and advice? The stricken man, as he puts himself together again, interpret his experience, make life sense of life clearly and aware of the prosperousness of such an effort. What this country needs, he writes at last, surrendering to the absurdity of his state, is five, a five, good five cent synthesis. He echoes Mr. Marshall, Woodward Wilson's vice president, who sat, said at about the time of the Great War, what this country needs is a good five cent cigar. Certain readers of Herzog complained the book was difficult much as they might have sympathized with the unhappy and comical history professor that were occasionally put off by his long and erudite letters. Some felt that they were being asked to sit for a difficult exam in a survey course in intellectual history and thought it mean of me to mingle sympathy and wit with obscurity and pedantry. But I was making fun of pedantry. Okay, blah, 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 talking about his own novel. Let's skip a couple paragraphs here. Uh, 
problem. I want to get to the professor. Yeah, here we go. This is still the Saul Bellow. I'm not sure what all that other jazz was about. But the heart of Professor Bloom's argument is that the university and a society ruled by public opinion was to have been an island of intellectual freedom where all views were investigated without restriction. Liberal democracy in its generosity made this possible. But by consenting to play an active or positive participatory, participatory role in society, the university has become inundated and saturated with the backflow of society's problems. Preoccupied with the questions of health, sex, race, and war, academics make their reputations and their fortunes I mean, the university has become society's conceptual warehouse of other harmful influences. Any proposed reforms of liberal education, which might bring the university into conflict with the whole of the USA, are unthinkable. Increasingly, the people inside are identical in their appetites and motives with the people outside the university. This is what I take Bloom to be saying. And if you were making a polemical statement merely, it would be easy enough to set aside. What makes it formidably dangerous is the accurate historical background accompanying the argument. He explains with an admirable command of political theory how all this came to be, how modern democracy originated, what Machiavelli, Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, and other philosophers of the Enlightenment intended and how their intentions succeeded or failed. The heat of the dispute between left and right has grown so fierce in the last decade that the habits of civilized discourse have suffered a scorching. Antagonists seem to no longer listen to one another it would be a pity if intelligent adversaries were not to read Professor Bloom's book with disinterested attention. Okay, let's get started. Enough of bellows. Preface, now we're with the professor. This essay, a meditation on the state of our souls, particularly of the young in their education, is written from the perspective of a teacher. Such a perspective, although it has grave limitations and is accompanied by dangerous temptations, is a privileged one. The teacher, particularly the teacher dedicated to liberal education, must constantly try to look toward the goal of human completeness and back at the natures of his students now and then, and seeking to understand the former, assess his capacities of the latter to approach it, Attention to the young, knowing what their hungers are and what they can digest, is the essence of the craft. One must spy out and elicit those hungers, for there is no real education that does not respond to a felt need. Anything else acquired is trifling display. What each generation can best be discovered in its relation to the permanent concerns of mankind. This, in turn, can best be discovered in each generation's tastes, amusement, and especially angers. This is above all true at an age that prides itself on calm self-awareness. Particularly revealing are the various imposters whose business it is to appeal to the young. These culture peddlers have the strongest of motives for finding out what are the appetites of the young. So they are also useful guides into the labyrinths of the spirit of the times. The teacher's standpoint is not arbitrary. It's neither simply dependent on what students think they want or happen to be in this place or that time, nor is it imposed on him by the demands of a particular society or vagaries in the market. Although much effort has been expended in trying to prove that the teacher is always the agent of such forces. In fact, he is willy-nilly, guided by the awareness or the divination that there is a human nature 
and then assisting in its fulfillment of the task. He, did, he, he does not come to this by way of extra, extractions or complicated reason. He sees it in the eyes of his students. Those students are potential, but potential points beyond itself. And this is the source of the hope, almost always disappointed, but ever renascent. That man is not just a creature of accident, chained to and formed by a particular cave in which he is born. Midwifery, the delivery of real babies, of which not the midwife, but nature is the cause, describes teaching more adequately than does the word socialization. The birth of a robust child independent of the midwife is the teacher's true joy. A pleasure far more effective in motivating him than any disinterested moral duty would be. His primary experience of contemplation more satisfying than any action. No real teacher can doubt that his task is to assist the pupil to fulfill human nature against all the deforming forces of convention and prejudice. A vision of what that nature is may be clouded. A teacher may be more or less limited, but his activity is solicited by something beyond him that at the same time provides him the standard. Moreover, there is no real teacher who in practice does not believe in the existence of the soul or in magic that acts on it through speech. The soul, so the teacher must think, may at the outset of education require extrinsic rewards and punishments to motivate its activity. But in the end, the activity is its own reward and self-sufficient. These are the reasons that help to explain the perversity of an adult who prefers the company of youth to that of grown-ups. He prefers the promising might be to the defective is. Such an adult is subject to many temptations, particularly vanity and the desire to propagandize rather than teach. The very activity with it, the danger of preferring teaching to knowing of adapting oneself to what students can or want to learn, of knowing oneself only by one's students. Thus teaching can be a threat to philosophy because philosophizing is a solitary request and he who pursues it must never look to an audience. But it is too much to ask that teachers be philosophers and a bit of attachment to one's audience is almost inevitable. And if it is well resisted, the very vice can turn into something of a virtue and encourage philosophizing. Fascination with one's students leads to an awareness of the various kinds of soul and their various capacities for truth and error, as well as learning. Such experience is the condition of investigating the question, what is man? in relation to the highest aspirations as opposed to his low and common needs. And I think that's about where we'll end. He's going to be advocating and arguing later that this is an age of relativism and even Nietzscheanization of values that undermines what the Quest for learning. We'll see. Verse 2 of 174. When the Pashkal blood is poured, death's dark angel sheathes his sword. Israel's hosts triumphant go through the wave that drowns the foe. Praise we Christ, whose blood was shed. Pashkal victim, Pashkal bread. With sincerity and love, we eat manna from above. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, without end. Amen. Godspeed.